The gospel reading is from uh, the gospel of Luke, chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. If you would like to follow along on this um, Bible, it's in the New Testament section, starting on um, on page 90. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They're walking seven miles. Just put that in the back of your head. And how long that takes. And talking with each other about all these things that had happened, meaning the crucifixion, the reports of Jesus' appearance after his death. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still and looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? while he was opening the scriptures to us. That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Sometimes uh, readers of advice columns will offer their own take on a situation. Years ago, I read such a letter and it went something like this. Dear Abby, I read the letter from the person wondering what's the point of going to church every week? The writer indicated he can't remember every sermon, so what's the point? It's not like it makes a big difference. It got me to thinking how I don't remember every dinner my wife ever made for me. However, I remember they tasted good, nourished me over 30 years so far. So it is with sermons and religious practices. We may not remember everyone or none at all, but over time we are shaped by what we practice regularly. Aside from wondering if this writer could cook and feed himself, (laughs) I found his observation quite comforting for a person who preaches a lot. Sometimes I do wonder, what's the point? (laughs) 
Is anyone really listening? <laughs> and what people say they hear is often not what is written on the pages from which I preach. A church member, now deceased, once said to me years ago that they thought ritual was silly, even distasteful, waste of time, not recognizing that here in our congregation, we engage in ritual, quite a lot of it. The Oxford Dictionary defines ritual as a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. Not sure why it has to be so solemn. Merriam-Webster doesn't think so. In, in that dictionary, ritual is a ceremonial act or action, an act or series of acts regularly repeated in a precise manner. And does it have to be precise, solemn and precise? Even prescribed are descriptors that leave many people feeling that ritual is constricting or dull, or it's just the same old, same old. <laughs> but ritual can also be a known container that frees us to experience the very moment that we are in. Communion is a ritual, very often solemn and prescribed. Though we're not super precise about all the words, as is the case in, in most Christian traditions. Novelty is more attractive to people. Something new and something different, something shiny, something more spectacular that feels more spiritual. Worship in the United States, at least among Protestant churches, is a case study over the last 30 or 40 years in the perceived need for novelty. For instance, you can Google this later, or you can Google it now, I don't care, and look up this video of baptizing people on a water slide. It's been done, and I'm sure it's done multiple times in multiple places. There's this video I saw, and the pastor says as quickly as he can, the prescribed words as the candidate slides down the slide into a waiting plastic pool on a large stage. It's spectacle. Ta-da! He's baptized. <laughs> I mean, the possibilities are endless in this, <laughs> in this facility. You know the old saw about putting new wine into old wineskins? You know, you shouldn't do that. Old wineskins can't hold the new stuff. I think it's been used to justify new things or doing old things in new ways, like baptism by water slide. That'll bring them in. Rituals get boring. We want to be engaged, entertained. God forbid we should be bored by anything. We want to be shazammed by the Spirit. We can't experience spiritual highs, though, and wonder every single time we pray, every time we worship, every time we serve. Sometimes there is great spiritual connection when we're serving. The desire to do so for this spiritual high leads many people to seek them as palliative, as a momentary high, a temporary amnesia in a world of harsh realities. Stephen Dowie is a, a Presbyterian minister, and he describes this as wonder addiction. He writes, it craves wonder as an inoculation against life's pain or its boredom. Wonder addiction shows itself in the perpetual quest for more dazzling, spirit-numbing forms of distraction and entertainment. Now, I don't want worship to be boring, you know. But on the flip side, sometimes we're bored by things. And growing our capacity to be with ourselves is actually something we do to mature as people, is growing comfortable being with ourselves, with our thoughts, in the midst of other things. The story from Luke that um, we read today, usually called the Walk to Emmaus. It is also the name of a ministry of the United Methodist Church. Yes. 
If you're online and you didn't hear the what, that was from our resident um, person from the Methodist tradition, Aaron. The walk, uh, this is from the Walk to Emmaus website. The Walk to Emmaus develops Christian disciples and leaders by inspiring, challenging, and equipping active adult church members for Christian action in their homes, churches, workplaces, and communities. It also benefits less active members who are seeking to renew a relationship with God, grow spiritually, and discover firmer foundations for their lives. The program begins with a 72-hour short course in Christianity. <laughs> Learn it all in 72 hours. That is wrapped in prayer and signs of sacrificial service. It's a vocation. They're saying this is a vocation. It continues for the rest of the participants' lives with follow-up groups that along with the church's robust offerings continue to to continue participants ongoing growth in grace. There's there's nothing novel or spectacular here. Just a steady ongoing practice of faith supported by the practices of the faith with people in the faith. <laughs> Prayer, service, learning, worship, more and more, right? The same old, same old. Last week, two of our children were holding hymnals. Now, they don't read music, but as I left the sanctuary, as we were singing the final hymn, and they're holding, I don't know if they were holding them this way or this way, but they were practicing. The familiar doesn't become familiar unless we practice and help others practice. The story in Luke ends in what appears to be a spectacular flourish, the sudden recognition of Christ and just a sudden disappearance of said figure. The story, however, is filled with the ordinary walking to get from point A to point B, conversation, listening to scriptures being interpreted, talking about it, even the spur of the moment invitation of hospitality is standard fare in that culture. That is something they would ordinarily do and then have a meal at the end of the day. Ritual becomes a burden when it ceases to be a means of practicing the presence of the holy. Ritual can become dogmatic and an end in of itself. And when a ritual, its proper performance, becomes more important than its purpose to provide this container for an experience of the holy, then it ceases to be truly a, a ritual. It becomes another sort of addiction. We have to do it this way. <laughs> the gift of ritual is it is the practice of the familiar that can reorient us to the gifts of grace and love, compassion and hope, peace and justice. The gift of ritual is the practice of what is known to encourage us to face the unknown to inspire our hearts to continue our walk of faith with others for the sake of the faith and the sake of the world. Christian contemplative uh, James Finley wrote that what comes welling up out of ordinariness of everything is the divinity of everything. The practice of communion is rooted in the familiar and in the ordinary. Table fellowship was the great equalizer in the time of Jesus, and it still is. It was a litmus test of social solidarity, and it still is. Eating together meant that a bond ran deeply among all of the participants, and it still can. Every week at the table of Christ, all of us, regardless of our status, economic, ethnic, uh, orientation, um, education, you just name it, 
regardless of whatever status we may think we have, we are invited to receive ordinary bread, ordinary juice, and we open ourselves to the possibility of being one with Christ and one with each other. Sometimes we may perceive it, and sometimes we may finish and, oh well, perceive nothing. Does that mean the sacred didn't show up? Is imperceptible, is non-existent? I don't think so. And sometimes for me, it's simply uh, in, a, in a few words of an elder's prayer or, or in the music that weaves itself around and inside me, and sometimes it's just an unbidden thought that comes as a whisper of grace, that there's a moment of recognition that the sacred is present, alive among us here. A lot of the spiritual life is just showing up when we're tired or bored, grieving, distracted and doubting. Showing up can require more effort than we think we have. A gift of our faith is that experiencing sacred doesn't require creating just the right circumstance with special elements. What comes welling up out of the ordinariness of everything is the divinity of everything. In the water with which you wash your hands is your baptism. In the air you breathe is the Spirit of God. In the company of people at the Olive Garden, getting your breadstick for lunch <laughs> is the presence of the one who welcomes us and walks with us. We practice together in this place at prescribed times in less than precise ways. <laughs> so we can recognize, like those disciples on the road, the presence of Christ in the ordinary elements and the everyday people. So kudos to you in the room and online. Kudos to you for showing up in hope, in solidarity, and in faith. Amen.